basically we should start. Let me take a few minutes just to introduce um, Vered, introduce you. I mean, Vered will introduce you, Professor Baba. Um, my name is uh, Eran Neumann. I'm the Dean of the Faculty of the Arts here at Tel Aviv University. I would like to welcome you all um, to this webinar, to our series, Art, Culture and Society in the post, if we may call, call it post, uh, coronavirus age. When we started, it seems like it's gonna be over soon, but now it's, you know, it seems no. that it's gonna stay much long, longer than expected. So um, I would like to welcome you all and good evening to everyone here in Israel. And good morning, afternoon or whatever to all those who are elsewhere. This is also one of the benefits of the, of the coronavirus. I'm very glad that you all have joined us for this fourth conversation in, in our series. Uh, I'd like to start with a special welcome to, and greeting to our distinguished guest uh, this evening, Professor Homi Baba. Uh, while I'm sure that he needs um, no introduction, I leave this pleasant duty to my friend, uh, uh, Dr. Vered Maimon, who will converse with him shortly. But before I hand the virtual mic uh, to Vered, I'd like to say a few words. Uh, here in Israel, we are in the midst of the second wave of the COVID-19 pandemic. The, the number of infections is climbing sharply, while the number of deaths uh, has remained almost unchanged so far. No doubt that the, this virus change is changing the world in fundamental ways, challenging, challenging existing structures, and significantly rising the level of fear and uncertainty in our lives. It seems, however, that the most dangerous aspect of this virus is not necessarily its lethal effect, effects, but rather its politicization and the ways in which it is being used and, uh, and, and abused by, uh, by, by certain powers. As the virus has proliferated widely, widely over the few uh, past, um, past few months, political structures has been transformed, in many ways becoming more centralized and less democratic. Civil and human rights have been widely and, and easily violated. Millions of people have lost their livelihoods and people on the lower end of the socioeconomic spectrum have found themselves even further marginalized. It is not the first time that, virus, that various regimes capitalize on, the, on crisis and grab, grab more power. And it seems that the nexus of power and capital has become even tighter as this crisis wears on. I'm certain that the distinguished guests we are going to have, we are having with us tonight, will provide us, provide us with some illuminating insights on these dark uh, days. And um, and I'm looking forward to hearing you, uh, Omi. Uh, and now let me introduce Vered, um, uh, who will converse with Professor Baba about uh, social issues and art and beyond uh, in relation to the current situation. Um, Vered Maimon is a senior lecturer at the Department of Art History at Tel Aviv University. Her essays on the history and theory of photography and contemporary art appeared in uh, many uh, journals, among them October, Oxford Art Journal, History of Photography, Art History, The Drama Review, uh, Photography is the Third Text, and many more. She's the author of Singular Images, Failed Copies, William Henry Fox Talbot and and the, uh, and the early photo, uh, photograph, uh, and the co-editor uh, co of Active Stills, Photography and Protest in Palestine, Israel, and Communities of Sense, Rethinking Aesthetics and Politics. Her new book, Contemporary Art, Photography and the Politics of Citizenship, is forthcoming uh, from Rutledge next month. So, Bered, I'm going to take the lead from here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Yaron, for this uh, wonderful introduction. And this is my great honor uh, to introduce uh, our guest. Uh, Homi Baba is the Anne Rothenberg Professor of the Humanities in the English and Comparative Literature Department at Harvard University. He was founding director of the Mihandra Humanity Center at Harvard University from 2011 to 2019 and director of the Harvard Humanity Center from 2005 to 2011. From 2008 to 2019, he held the inaugural position of Senior Advisor on the Humanities 
to the president and provost at Harvard University, and from 2005 to 2008, served as senior advisor in the humanities at the Rutland Institute for Advanced Study. Baba is the author of numerous works exploring post-colonial theory, culture change and power, contemporary art, and cosmopolitanism. His works include Nation and Narration and The Location of Culture, which was reprinted as a Routage classic in 2004. His next book will be published by the University of Chicago Press. Baba has written on contemporary art for Art Forum and has written a range of essays on William Kentridge, Anish Kapoor, Tyreen Simon, and Matthew Barney, amongst others. He is a member of the Academic Committee for the Shanghai Power Station of Art, advisor on the Contemporary and Modern Art Perspectives Project at the Museum of Modern Art in New York, and curator in residence of the Boston Museum of Fine Arts. In 2019, he was honored by the Institute of Contemporary Art in London for his influential work in studies of colonialism, post-colonialism, and globalization. So it's a great honor to have Homi Baba with us tonight. Uh, Professor Baba will start with an opening statement about the condition of unpreparedness. This will be followed by a conversation, and then we will open uh, the discussion to questions from the audience. From the audience, please. Well, it's my great pleasure <clears throat> to be in uh, two places at once. For much of my life, I've always wanted to be in two places, never deciding where I wanted really to be, moving between them. So now you make it possible for me to be in Tel Aviv and in Cambridge, Massachusetts at the same time. And guess where it's more exciting to be? Guess where the restaurants are better? Guess where the cinema is better? You really need me to tell you. Uh, I'm delighted to be here. Thank you. I want to thank Eran Neumann for Professor Neumann, the Dean, for his uh, uh, invitation and also for his invitation to be there in person at the University of Tel Aviv. So thank you very much. And of course, to Professor Vera Maimon, thank you, Brad, for your uh, tremendous uh, care with which you have prepared this conversation. You really are a co-author of this event, and I'm delighted to have you as my colleague. Uh, let me just say a few words, and then we can enter into a discussion, both amongst ourselves and with the audience. I want to thank the audience, of course, for being with us in this virtual form, uh, uh, which we're all learning to deal with. So I hope uh, we can provide you with an hour and a half of engagement and uh, and conversation, and thank you for being with us. Thank you very much. <clears throat> uh, just a few words to set the tone of where my thoughts are at the moment. In the life and arts section of the Weekend Financial Times of May the 9th, Gillian Tett, chair of the Financial Times' US editorial board, published a front page article titled Against the Odds. Her essay is a reflection on risk as an existential predicament involving individuals and institutions who find themselves on the anxious knife edge of hazardous choices. The risk averse choose a future protected by norms and reasonableness, predictable security and cautious optimism. Risk takers, however, summon up what is called Dutch courage to face precarious futures of doubt and danger in the hope that contingency may unlock unimagined realms of agency, liberty, and opportunity. In the midst of quarantine cabin fever, Gillian Tett prizes open the porthole to speculate on the risks of a post-lockdown future. Ted asks, how will governments and individuals weigh the difficult daily decisions facing us when we leave lockdown? Her answers derive primarily from her expertise as a financial journalist 
immersed in the risk management of markets and financial institutions. This time, however, Tet focuses on the culture of risk. Culture matters, she writes emphatically, as she lays out her leading argument. Medical data and economic trade-offs will certainly play an important part in any decision governments and individuals make to return to public communal styles of life. But as we juggle with risk, supposedly, she writes, neutral data, risk models, and forecasts will have to come to terms with psychological biases, cultural assumptions, and inconsistent incentives. Because medical science can reveal death rates and frame mortality risks, she says, but models cannot tell us how and when we might feel safe. In a place like America, Tet concludes, it is also possible to imagine a rebellion whereby the burden of risk is handed back to the individual. Tet refers, of course, to COVID-related deaths and the post-lockdown rebellion, she imagines, would most likely be staged by Trumpian ethno-nationalists for whom wearing a face mask is supposedly an affront to their First Amendment rights, which I assume include the right to create pandemic pandemonium in the service of making America great again, as Mr. Trump never fails to repeat. But Ted's speculations on the risk to human health in the aftermath of the lockdown, considered in the wake of the risk to black lives on the public highway and at home at the hands of the police, lead me to reflect further on the language of risk and the nature of rebellion as part of the post-lockdown predicament. We were cautiously expecting to emerge from lockdown to embrace some version of our public lives and reclaim something of the shared freedom of public spaces. What we were quite unprepared for was the tragic resumption of public life as a result of an unwarranted and unprovoked public death. Instead of gathering on neighborhood streets, maintaining the hygiene of social distancing, bystanders in the Powderhorn district of Minneapolis witnessed the curbside killing of a black man, George Floyd. All 84 8.46 minutes of asphyxiating agony as Derek Chauvin, a white police officer, extinguished a life with the pressure of his knee. Despite Floyd's repeated pleas for mercy, I can't breathe, and witnesses imploring Chauvin to desist, he dug his knee into Floyd's neck. Several hundreds of thousands of protesters across the world quite simply risked the ravages of COVID-19 to exercise their right to protest against a system of criminal injustice that would enable a routine procedure of law and order to result in a brazen act of violence resembling a public execution. Americans were as unprepared for the viral pandemic as they were for the pandemonium of racial policing. According to the Pew Global Survey, published on June the 12th, 2020, the levels of interest in the protests nearly match the shares of Americans who were following news about the coronavirus outbreak in late April before Floyd's death. So Floyd's death and the coronavirus both absorbed the American public, almost four-tenths four of the public, in some sectors, almost half the public, were as engaged with both these issues. What does that tell us? What does it mean to be unprepared for something that has a long history of happening? 
Recorded pandemics have occurred for several hundreds of years and police killings of black men and women in avoidable and unjust circumstances in the UK and as in the US are part of a recurrent cycle of institutional racial violence. And yet, the moment of being unprepared, the global response, for instance, to the 8.46 minutes of George Floyd's life circulated on social media is rarely recognized as a significant feature of public historical record. It is too quickly absorbed into normative narratives of cause and consequence, reason and risk, symptom and structure. The singular death of a black man most often becomes part of the predictable data of structural racism, except as in this case, when it doesn't. Is unpreparedness solely or even principally an effective response with a limited scope of political efficacy? I've chosen this complex term for two reasons. First, it speaks of contingent circumstances in which people find themselves at a loss for action and agency. They're unprepared for an event or eventuality because their destiny is out of their hands. And many people in New York felt completely unprepared for 9-11, although they knew that there were these terrorist movements working towards making an attack. So you can be unprepared and yet have a foreknowledge of the general trend that exists in society. Secondly, the term unprepared is also one to which governments continually resort in evading their state of unpreparedness to explain away their culpability and responsibility when faced with the consequences of misgovernance or miscalculation. In such circumstances, they resort, as we know, to the language of crisis and emergency in order to argue that their failures are a consequence of overwhelming circumstances. This was true, if you remember, when we had the refugee crisis. People were quite aware that the attack on Libya or on Syria, without being properly primed and created, would create massive migration including Afghanistan, of course, in this. Then there were civil wars in parts of the world. And yet when you had these large migration flows, they were immediately seen as being crises. And government said, we are not re responsible for these crises. And not being responsible for the crisis allows you then to say, well, you know, we are doing the best we can, but it's a crisis, it's an emergency, we can't do any better. So governments use this notion of being unprepared in a way to impose, to both to cover up their own histories of wrong steps and in fact, or of hasty steps or of misjudged steps and indeed then use them to further, further um, um, uh, um, influence, to further repress populations, to further surveil populations. So there are two kinds of unpreparedness. The ubiquitous phrase of being unprepared in the media and public discourse is not merely a matter of words. Unpreparedness is descriptive of events and experiences as they occur in the present. But it is also a term for a future predicament of predictive precariousness that shapes the way in which we conceive of the relation between knowledge and action or principle and policy as they shape the citizen's consciousness of the future. And I use the word predictive precariousness. You can predict it because you know it from the past and yet the present is precarious. This complex notion of unpreparedness is different from risk assessment. And we really need to take it on increasingly in the world today. Increasingly with the rampant disregard for facts, science, history and human dignity displayed by those who occupy the highest offices in countries around the world, citizens and residents are being actively unprepared to stand up for their democratic rights and representations 
or to organize around these public goods by the exercise of discriminatory laws, punitive regulations, censorship, and the depredations of social media. And now, of course, the new surveillance is the most important thing. Everybody has to be surveilled in order to create security. But as James Baldwin once said, societies which try to surveil and regulate their populations, to police their populations, are the least safe societies for those who are in fact poor, for those who are dissidents, for those who disagree. These, their lives become even more precarious among societies who try and create this kind of normative surveillance um, um, security. So the security state is not always the safest state to belong to if you are outside the understanding of the government's notion of security. In these circumstances, I want to suggest that being unprepared may be an inflection point one that primes you for becoming an effective agent, a citizen, by first taking you aback, shocking you, and then giving you the opportunity to recover and right yourself, and hence to stand up against the illegitimate uses of power and the abuses of authority. Thought of in this way, the panicky moment of unpreparedness that we all might feel might well prepare you to live up to the responsibility of taking action under pressure and making decisions in relation to risk. Unpreparedness may appear to be a pre-political moment in the life of the subject and the citizen, but it may equally be a quality of time to be on that moment of being unprepared in the midst of flux and fire to decipher an ethical predisposition that leads to deliberate and deliberative democratic action. Unpreparedness is a moment in time and history that engages with complex emotions, ambivalence, fear, doubt, disappointed hope, that belong to the darker side of psychic life and ethical deliberation. They are often overwhelmed and as obscured by the more valiant public virtues of courage, confidence, decision, and valor. Um, unpreparedness for all its volatility and turbulence marks an essential turning point in the transition between the uncertain anxiety of self-examination and an unavoidable commitment to the public good. To be open to being unprepared, then, is to develop a capacity to engage in the ethics of mutuality and equality, and to be committed to the modest art of listening and learning from cultures of difference and communities of disadvantage, which are indeed the beating heart of the democratic experience. Such is the revolution in ethical conduct and political consciousness that James Baldwin, my closest friend in these fragile times, has unforgettably described as the resilience of the negative way. He writes, the price of liberation of the white people is the liberation of the blacks. The total liberation in the cities, in the towns, before the law and in the mind. The price of this transformation is the unconditional freedom of black people. It is not too much to say that they who have been so long rejected must now be embraced and at no matter what psychic or social risk, black people are the key figures in this country and the American future is precisely as bright or as dark as their future is. My friends, protesters the world over who were unprepared to witness another law and order racial killing decided, and of course I'm being ironic here because no law and order act should result in the death of the alleged 
victim. No law and order act should end like that. So protesters the world over who were unprepared to witness another law and order racial killing decided to risk their health and in some cases their livelihoods to stand up as a people, as one for issues of global inequality, injustice against minorities and the tyranny of ethno-nationalist populist leaders democratically elected who in these current crises have played fast and loose with the issues of science, public health, and state violence. They have used them regrettably to their advantage. Yes, the moment of unpreparedness is as figurative a measure of time as is a period or an age or any other such definition of the historical long durée through which we construct the meanings of events and construe their social outcomes. Yes, when I talk about the moment of unpreparedness, of course, it is real, but it is also figurative. It's also metaphorical. It's a form of feeling, of affect, and yet we all experience it. But the unprepared carries with it, I believe, an important affective charge of a political or historical moment of suddenness, a stunning illustration of emotion leading to cognition and uncertainty leading to agency and action. It is this very temporality of suddenness that marks the advent of both COVID-19 and Black Lives Matter as global phenomena. Yes, we know that some countries repressed it. They lied. They did the most regrettable things not to prepare their own populations. They used unpreparedness as a way of covering up their own inefficiencies, their own inability to plan for these things. But we've got to understand that for most people, COVID-19 was presented with a suddenness. For the, for the migrant workers in India, they were given four hours to de-densify, or five hours to de-densify the cities, to go back to their villages and towns, which they could hardly do because there was no proper transport arrangements. But they were given this short space of time to somehow disperse. And I want us to understand that these short spaces of time are both important for the individual this moment of unpreparedness or suddenness to begin to think about how we respond, how we understand, how we shape our action. But equally on the other side, these short moments of time are manipulated very often by the powers that be to suddenly lay down a law, a regulation, a presidential order. And I think we've got to, in our current moment, think about both faces of unpreparedness whether we like it or not, whether it's ambivalent or difficult or obscure, that's the task at hand. We've got to think about it from both sides. The importance of acknowledging the suddenness of contemporary crises as they overwhelm us and being prepared to negotiate with their unprepared presentness as grounds for transformative change has a long philosophical genealogy. Soren Kierkegaard, author of The Concept of Anxiety, 1844, and The Sickness Unto Death, 1849, could there indeed be more timely titles for our own times as this to say. And I quote him, the moment, the concept of the moment is a figurative expression, and therefore it is not easy to deal with. What we call the moment, Plato calls the sudden, the possible corresponds exactly to the future. For freedom, the possible is the future. And the future is for time, the possible. And we often experience both, I would like to say, in this moment of suddenness, in this moment of the unprepared. To both of these, Kierkegaard says, corresponds anxiety in the individual life. An accurate and correct linguistic usage, therefore, associates anxiety with the future. In the light of these, think these thinkers cast 
on the darkness of human mortality and racial death, I argue in Kierkegaard's sense and in Baldwin's spirit in favor of the sudden movement, the anxious unpreparedness that drives freedom to reach its future moment, or better still, to achieve its future momentum. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Thank you very much. So Thank let me let me follow up on this notion of unpreparedness because it's actually a complex condition, right? On the one hand, it registered the outbreak on an event that is both unexpected, but on the other end, inevitable, right? Due to long histories of racism and, uh, of course, uh, uh, neglect of public health. Um, and while being unprepared triggers effective response of uncertainty, fear, and ambivalence, it also opens the possibility for, uh, to recover oneself and uh, develop a capacity to engage uh, in uh, an ethics of equality and reciprocity, right? So we have this kind of complex uh, condition. So it seems to me that with this term, you are actually offering us a way to rethink what political agency and resistance mean in, uh, in the current moment of crisis, during the lockdown and uh, afterwards, right? And um, you offer us a way to conceive, for example, the demonstration by Black Lives Matter that um, um, on the one hand respond, is, is a spontaneous response to uh, the murder of George Floyd, and on the other hand, offer also a response to Trump's incapacity to deal with the crisis and with the magnitude of the uh, epidemiological crisis, which is revealed to be a political crisis, right? So my question is um, how we can use this term to rethink about the meaning of agency and resistance, considering also the use of the media and social media. <clears throat> Thank you, Vered. Um, I think this is a very important question because I'm making a provocative claim here. I am saying that usually when we think about uh, agency, political agency, or even ethical agency, we tend to think in long institutional terms how a movement gets built up over time, the civil rights movement, or the fact that the Black Lives Movement has been developing now over time, developing its ideas, its policies, and its institutional structures. I want to suggest that that's absolutely important. Policy makers think of in terms of numbers over and graphs over long periods of time. All that knowledge is very important. And all that knowledge builds up the milieu or the atmosphere in a country of political possibilities. With the Black Lives Matter, we de develop the political possibilities of what we see today over time. The civil rights movement, was also behind the Black Lives Matter and other such, there are many other such important justice, social justice organizations. All that is very important, but I also want to draw attention to the moments which we are unprepared for ourselves and take action and discover agency that belongs to the moment of revolt. So that here in this instance, you have the dovetailing, a sort of a perfect storm in a way, between the lockdown, people's lives being made insecure, people being constrained, feeling this sense almost of an imprisonment. And as you know, in the African-American male community, there's a highest percentage of incarceration of black males. I am not making an easy comparison. I'm only saying that people have this experience of being pent up and then at the same time, then you have the racial killing on the street at the moment at which people thought they were going to open up 
At that point, you begin to have this law and order murder. And I put it in that way. It was an act of supposed law and order which created this situation. At these times, people develop agencies which are much over a shorter period of time. They are, they are not big political decisions. They are sudden protests and demonstrations. And yet we have seen how this form of agency, which is effective, which is both emotional as well as political, can grasp the imagination of a people of all different races who can come out different generations and come out and make a change and make a big transformative change as we have seen. This is not to devalue the long institutional developments and the institutional right. authority, not at all. Right. But I think we have to think about this. And I think one way in which we have to also think about it, two, two ways. One is that it's my feeling that the old notion of party politics is coming apart now. Mm -hmm. Democrats versus Republicans, Tories versus Liberal and Labour. These, these notions of political affiliation, political parties are unfortunately coming apart for many reasons which we can't go into today. But as they come apart, new movements are being formed. People are seeing themselves not with party affiliations, but affiliations to certain causes. And let me say that the time, and now we've got to confront people who take up positions that we may deeply deplore, racist positions, racist movements. After all, Steve Bannon, an advisor to many international governments and, and an early advisor to Trump, was quite clear when he said, we are into movement politics now, not party politics. And it can go. So these movement politics don't have party affiliations in a way. Party political parties generally are successful when different political ideologies at least have a sense of the same, they know the rules of the game. They may break them, they may change them, but at least they know there are some rules of the game. In movement politics, those same kinds of accepted rules of the game are not apparent. And in that context, I, I think that it's very important to understand the role of the media. The role of this social media plays a role. It becomes another virtual gathering space. Sometimes for the kind of politics I deplore and you would deplore at other times for the politics of solidarity around causes that I consider to be part of public virtue and the good life. So I think that that's the reason why the moments I'm pointing to is the moments of the unprepared are important, although they are dangerous moments too. Yeah. But, it's not, but it is not our choice. I mean, politics never said this is safe. Ethics never said these are safe choices. Yeah. Politics and ethics are difficult because they are not safe choices. It's interesting that you, that you see the danger, but you also see the possibility. Yes. So let me, let, me, let, let me follow up on that because you focus on Trump, right? Because you live in the US. But right. of course, Trump is one of a group of authoritarian leaders right. that emerged in uh, recent decades. We have Putin in Russia, we have Modi in India, we have Erdogan in Turkey, and we have Netanyahu uh, in Israel. Now, the support these leaders are gaining hinges on the link that they make between nationalistic, populistic, and racist uh, ideologies, and a consistent attack on democratic institutions and procedures, right? Excellent. And yeah, I'm, I'm in... I'm interested in the way um, it kind of problematizes certain aspects of your past work. For example, you always talked about the complex relation between the nation and the empire, right? Uh, you you the always showed, nation and empire. You an said, empire, yeah. yeah. You always showed how the enlightenment and the spreading of democracy is based on a split within the colonial subject, right? what uh, ideals and ideas 
the subject holds at home in Asia and what kind of ideals he holds with regard to the empires as part of his aim to Christianize and uh, civilize the racial and ethnic others, making him, as you famously said, uh, almost the same, but not quite. But it seems to me that with the global emergence of the alt-right, we are seeing how racism and xenophobia are operating not as, as a result of the dark side of the Enlightenment, but as part of an effort to challenge the validity of those ideas. So, um, and which are now described as elitist and not reflecting the will of the people. And of, of course, they are all the time politically instrumentalized to divide. Um, so do you see a shift in the way power operates in the current moment, in the way that the legacies of colonialism are invoked? Oh, um, yes. Of course, there are differences, but uh, in, in the way in which power um, uh, operates now, the technologies of power and surveillance have changed. As I said, there is social media has emerged as a player, as an agent almost in our political lives. It's a new institution. It's not simply the press. And why is it not simply like the press? Because now, Social media on a minute to minute basis can bring you news, can bring you opinion. Sometimes it's true, sometimes it's false. So there's this whole creation of unpreparedness as part of the atmosphere also of the social media. Where, it, What are you to answer? What is false knowledge? What is being put forward as alternative truths? This is something quite new. The question of surveillance is something quite new. Uh, 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 surveillance in, in terms of nation states and also global surveillance. And you started with the fact that now we have a phalanx of leaders across the world who seem to, in an almost miraculous way, have the same ideas. And they are all men. Let's not forget, they are all men, which is a strange thing in the almost the middle, <coughs> or at least the first third of the 21st century, to have these phalanx of male leaders. And beyond that, they all advertise their masculinity. Their politics is a gendered masculinist politics of authoritarianism. And yet 30% to 40% of the people in the world in each of these countries, not sure about Israel, follow this. This is the hardcore 30%. So things have changed. They've also changed because as you pointed out, in the various leaders and countries you mentioned, we are not now talking about the global north versus the global south. The global north and the global south, the post-colonial world and the metropolitan world are, have elected the same kind of leaders. So we can't simply say that this is a colonial, uh, um, um, you know, uh, the afterlife of colonialism or colonial hangover. This authoritarianism is not in, in India or in Israel or whatever. It's not simply to be based on, um, uh, on, on the past. The attitude towards uh, Indian untouchables or Palestinians or Israeli Arabs or minorities in the United States, African-Americans, these are long struggles. So I think we have to put the long view and the short view together. So that I answer, my answer is that there is the new conditions, new framing conditions, but the earlier histories are also being filtered through these new conditions. Now, let me go back <clears throat> to the question of the Enlightenment. You know, in a way, the Enlightenment that, or the darker side of the Enlightenment, uh, the colonial side of the Enlightenment, uh, and it's important to make the distinction because the notion of the dark enlightenment was happening even in Europe, people who were, who were rejecting the ideas of the enlightenment. So that's another kind of dark enlightenment. But this dark enlightenment is actually worth thinking about because the very moment at which notions of citizenship and national pride and patriotism were being produced in the West as sustaining ideas of the sovereignty of nations, 
their liberalism and their democracy, depending upon these ideas of a shared world, of a notion of upstanding citizens, people with rights, that was almost the very moment where Indians and Africans and other peoples in the 19th century were being deprived of their rights and their citizenship. So, you know, that problem of the Enlightenment, which we saw that the moment of the creation of the Western citizen was the moment of, of, the, of the inability for the Indian Hindu, Muslim, or the Indian subject to become a citizen. These were happening at the same time. The powers that were creating citizenship were creating what they called native subjectivity at the same time. So this kind of paradoxical synchrony, I think, exists today. The same kind of pattern exists today. Of course, in altered circumstances, that here now you have the United States of America, the great bastion of democracy, and yet the murder on the streets of a black individual after black individual. And who are citizens. Who are, who citizens. are citizens. Who are citizens. The unwarranted. You know, that's why I use the word law and order. These acts where these people have died have all been supposed to be acts of maintaining law and order, which makes you think the racialized vision of law and order in many of our countries, and of course the racial element might be differently defined, whether it's against a Palestinian or whether it's against an untouchable or an American black, but think about it. It was under the view of law and order that colonial powers all the way in the 19th and early 20th century created their sedition laws that any nationalist who spoke up any anti-colonial was seen to be a may create an act of sedition, of overthrowing the state, disloyalty. So I think law and order has a long imperial history and a long post-colonial history in the global south and also in the global north. And today we see the use of some of those same law and order acts being used, which are then result in acts of criminal injustice. I don't call it the criminal justice system. I call it against minorities and migrants, I now call it the criminal injustice system. Okay, so we are in a moment of a major political and um, cultural crisis. I want to ask, how do you see the role of educational institutions, in particular universities, in this global state? You have spoken, written about the need to develop uh, a humanist and liberal pedagogy uh, and a new language, a poetic one that evokes the imagination in order to deal with issues relating to human rights, to asylum seeking, to immigration. But liberal education and the humanities are going through a major crisis, not only in the US, but all over the world. And it's been taking place for, uh, for a long time now. And not only the humanities, but also critical thinking. And if I recall, or I'm thinking about your essay from 1999, the commitment to theory, which was so provocative and important, we're now feeling or experiencing the kind of sense of exhaustion of this kind of theoretical impulse. So my question is, how is it possible to reclaim the value, the importance of the humanities? and to revitalize critical thinking in face of big data and the fetishization of technology and science? So, very important questions, my dear Vered, and you do have a habit of having all these intelligent questions following each other like a great many-layered cake. <laughs> <laughs> And which you have to take a slice. And once you take a slice of the cake, you get the cream, you get the fruit, you get the, you know, the, the, the raisins, you get the nuts all in the same time. So I'm happily 
consuming this cake, but I can only answer some parts of it on this occasion. Sure. I hope there will be. I'm only trying to provoke you. I know, and you provoked me beautifully. So <laughs> thank you very much. Well, first of all, you provoked me completely. I'm not at all exhausted by critique or theoretical. Me too. Me too. I'm totally in it. I think that it's the lack of this kind of thinking, trying to think on from the foundations about problems, not just respond to the symptoms or the surface symptoms. That's what theoretical thinking is. There, as I said in that essay, and I've said several times again, to think a theoretical problem is not to invoke a specific language or jargon. It is not to refer to a particular thinker. You've got to first understand what you want to understand. What is the problem? And a, and a theoretical problem always comes like a knot. There are practical aspects of it. There are more conceptual aspects of it. And, it, and the more knotted it is, the more complex it is, the more knotted it is. And the more knotted it is, the more important it is. And we, in the humanities, and I'm sure in the social sciences too, but we who have devoted our lives to academia, to intellectual work, to being public intellectuals, it is our duty to take these knots of the everyday and the universal, the, the, the practical and the philosophical, and work with these knots and make people see how important these knots are because that's the way life presents itself. It doesn't present itself by giving you abstract thinking at one level, and practical problems at another. So having said that, let me say that I think theory and practice as are like a recto and verso of the same piece of paper. They're on two sides of the same piece of paper and we have got to see them in that way. So I don't believe in this sense that there was a critique, a time where critique was seen as being outside of the contingent and problematic flow of everyday problems. I believe critique that is divorced from commitment to theory is actually no critique at all. The critique must come out of the problem. It's not simply imposed on the problem, like say the World Bank uh, or the Washington Consensus goes to various third world countries and imposes a model of development, which then of course fails and creates international debt. So let me say by that very practical example, what I, that I believe that critique and theory are alive and kicking and very well. And I would like to modestly submit that this way of thinking about unpreparedness, which is an unconventional response to the current situation, which people seem to have found very, seem to have found engaging in many different you know, institutions that have asked me to speak over the last month since I started thinking in this way, that it's one of these kinds of uh, contributions to critique and, and, and thinking. But what about the humanities? You're quite right. I think one of the real issues is <clears throat> that we, we, we have been thinking for a long and productive time about interdisciplinarity as being a mark of the humanities. Of course, interdisciplinary thinking has been part of the scientific perspective for a very, very long time. You know, inter the sciences now only recognize themselves as interdisciplinary because the sciences increasingly think not in terms of disciplinary divisions, but of problems. So if you have a problem, you bring in an epidemiologist, you bring in an ethicist, you bring in a physicist, a chemist, a, a biological um, um, neurologist to look at the problem. And I think the humanities, we've been talking about, about interdisciplinarity, but what we have not been able to do is create these more laboratory-like structures where we don't claim always our disciplinary sovereignty or priority. I, you know, if there is a literary aspect to this problem, I know best because I have been, I've studied literature. I think what we need is a more modest sharing and communication if we, in, in the humanities, despite the fact that we talk about interdisciplinarity. I think we need to think increasingly. This is what I think the value of the humanities is 
the humanity, as humanists, we are trained academically as scholars. But to be able to really use that scholarship, we have to take up intellectual problems. We cannot simply take up academic issues. We've got to take up intellectual issues. And by intellectual issues, I mean issues that continually challenge concepts with the way the world is. And through that, we've got to build a kind of interdisciplinary, intellectual, public, uh, publicly committed community. So first point, therefore, of how to think about the object of knowledge, which is not just one discipline placed next to another, but in a way, different disciplines coming together and creating a problem for all these disciplines. So you're continually restructuring the framework of knowledge in an open way. But doing that, and I then stress the intellectual importance of that, not only the scholarly and academic importance, that then makes us understand our role of the, the role of the humanities in civic social life. Sometimes we think about this in global terms, you know, how we are committed to certain global ideas of human rights, for instance. Problematic though that is, because you know, human rights are also dependent on different cultural interpretations of humanity and different cultural interpretations of rights. What is the human? What is the human? So the part of it is that. But the other part that sometimes we neglect by talking only in global terms are the ways in which humanists have local, very local and important commitments and duties. And somehow that civic training in the humanities, that intellectual commitment with everyday life is something that we need to develop better than we have. Yeah. Let me finally say that it's very important in my way of thinking, while it's very important to see the differences between scientific experimentation, experimentation as being one of the major scientific modes of truth and proof, and humanistic modes of producing truth and knowledge. And I think there is a distinction in this way. The sciences are more end result oriented until you have the experiment and then you reprove the experiment, do it again and again. Many other issues don't turn up. They're, they're as I can tell, and I say, speak modestly, aimed towards a certain end, finding a certain uh, 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 solution to a mathematical problem, or finding a certain chemical uh, solution to an, or a, or a, or a, or a uh, uh, finding the right kind of medicine or uh, for a particular kind of issue. So the experiment is end oriented. In the humanities, every sentence we write, every word we choose, every metaphor we use, as we are doing the work, in the very means and process of doing the work we continually make a decision as to, is this the right word? Is this the right nuance of meaning? Is this the right image? Is this the right color to produce this kind of affective issue? So our relationship to the tools with which we work are as much conceptual as they are effective, as much about cognition as it is about imagination. And the ethical process is an ongoing questioning. And the sciences focus very much on, as I say, the end result of experiments. For us, we are not, we, experimentation is not our mode of, first mode of knowledge. Our mode of knowledge is interpretation. And interpretation is not only about the right meaning or getting the right feeling, but interpretation is as much about weighing the most judicious and ethically um, um, uh, sensitive, responsible way of writing or thinking. The humanities are continually evalu evaluating themselves because their method of learning is interpretation. That's 
that's a very provocative answer. Thank you very much. I mean, I I know. the idea of collaboration, I mean, I think I hear also something about the need to collaborate within the humanities rather than this kind of solitary scholar uh, detached, but the kind of need to collaborate, to think about problems that are pertaining to people's life. So I think that's, that's a very um, provocative way of looking at that. Put the and problem first, put your discipline, not don't put it aside because we are trained in this way, put the problem at the center and make the discipline structure the way you, uh, where you interpret the problem and use the discipline to bring in other disciplines when you see that your own discipline or training cannot deal with certain things. The problem is always bigger than any person or any discipline or any method. And you know, this reminds me, since I'm talking to you in Tel Aviv, one of the really great, uh, great people who's been a good, very good friend over time, although I haven't seen him, and if he's speaking or if any of his friends are listening, please give Avishai Margalit my warmest regards. But from Avishai, I learned something about the importance of the humanity. The humanities may not produce models. They may not produce models. As I say often, they produce communities. We don't build models, we build communities. I've said this about my own humanity center again and again. And one of the thoughts I got from Avishai, which helped me to think about this, was when he said it is as important to learn from negative politics as it is to learn from positive politics. You learn as much you learn from oppression what freedom can be. But usually people say, this is what freedom is, this is what liberty is, and this is, an X, Y, or Z is the negation of liberty. Imprisonment is the negation of liberty. Denial of rights is the negation of, of, of freedom. Avishai puts it very well, said, let's learn from what the negative, how we arrive at the positive, not only take the normative positive um, so I owe this to him, and uh, and from there I began to think, you know, that at the humanities, because we believe in negative politics, understanding, sorrow, survival, uh, failure, doubt, we ambivalence, we start from these things, and then we build, therefore, not models, but communities. So let me put another layer on this discussion. One of the arenas in which uh, political contestation has been taking place in the current moment is museums, right? Uh, last spring, we've seen major demonstrations in the context of the Whitney Biennial calling for the resignation of Warren Kanders, who was uh, one of the trustees of the museum and um, owner of a company that produces military supplies. And then when the new MoMA opened in, uh, in the fall, it rearranged its uh, permanent collection uh, in a way that challenges hegemonic histories of art to include uh, African-American uh, artists and others that were traditionally uh, excluded from display and visibility. And then the Tate Modern uh, recently hired uh, curators for contemporary African and Asian art. So my question is, can museums really disconnect themselves from colonial histories that inform their collections and systems of classification and evaluation? Can global exhibitions of contemporary art take part in the creation of a truly egalitarian, cosmopolitan, uh, hybrid culture? Or this institution simply enforce cultural uh, colonization and economic inequalities. Like for example, we've seen with the building and the uh, opening of branches of the Louvre and the Guggenheim in Abu Dhabi. Let me take the uh, um, um, second, the last part of your question first. So, you know, it's not only museums that have opened actual branches across the world. 
but universities have done the same thing. <clears throat> and each of your questions, I'm afraid, is a, needs a complex answer, and I'm not able to give the full strength of it. So I apologize, but let me just say what I can say in the time we have there. It does strike me as an irony that in many societies, uh, and in particular, since you mentioned the Louvre and the Guggenheim in the, in the Gulf states, you have institutions that pride themselves on their liberal vision of equality, Bra uh, creating branches in societies that are, for a number of reasons, not part of a liberal view of the value of men and women or the, or, or the equality of opportunity. So you have these liberal institutions founding themselves in these places where you do not have a prevailing idea of liberal humanities, for instance, or the liberal arts. And that certainly raises questions. It raises questions that, which suggest that many of these institutions do it partly for the, for the, for the economic benefit in a globally uh, uh, developing educational or museum system. Uh, in, in other, they, the, these institutions themselves argue that what they're trying to do is to take in societies which do not have that kind of cosmopolitan liberalism, they're trying to create institutions where, at least in their bubble, they can provide such knowledge to people who, uh, who, who attend those institutions or to go to those museums. I think that I'm sure the people who believe that do it sincerely because I know some of them, they're very fine people. Uh, I still think the jury is out on this. I think that you have to see what is the long-term effect. Have these institutions who bring the letter of, the, of, of liberalism and pluralism, have they really been able to change the political structure of those states? Have they been able to influence the way in which a lot of Gulf states depend upon migrant labor from South Asia who are much better paid than they would be in their own countries? but who are kept in conditions which no citizen would want to be kept in. So I think this is a, you've touched on a very important issue. And I think that this issue, the, you know, I have my ideas on it, you may have yours, but to do credit, we have to wait and see whether these institutions are able to change the structures of society. Because after all, museums and universities in most societies are like a bellwether. They are like the, uh, you know, they are like the litmus test of the world around them. Are these simply exotic cosmopolitan entities in a world that is not changing or have they contributed to the struggle for democracy, independence um, uh, in, in these societies? And I think this is a very good question to ask and we have to wait, these are young institutions we have to wait to see what happens. But I think that we should pose questions and we should be um, very attentive to this problem because it's a, very it's a very real problem to found a liberal institution based on liberal cosmopolitan ideas in a society which has not been tolerant or welcoming of those ideas. I think that's a very good question. And we have to, we have to be very attentive to see how this experiment works out or whether so we've got to be both uh, attentive and we've got to be we've got to keep our a tolerant skepticism a tolerant skepticism about I, the answer I, I, so I, far but maybe things will change but i really think it's important to keep that that ethical perspective or that uh, political perspective on this now uh, you know, it's often not all not all museums have the same kind of colonial past. Yes, encyclopedic museums, these great large museums like the British Museum or the Met 
or these big encyclopedic historical museums, more often than not, house objects whose provenance, whose provenance is questionable. The repatriation of these objects is a very real issue from a number of perspectives. It's not simply that you return the object, but in order to return the object, it has to be received in the right way. It has to be maintained. It has to be kept. There has to be, the society has to invest in these objects. I don't think you can only think of cultural ownership because very often the moment from which those objects were removed is a different history. So I think in ideal circumstances, you would want to, if there was an object that was extraordinarily important, or not even that, but an object that a community, whether it's the Native American community, the African American community, the Indian <clears throat> communities, you know, of, of art communities felt really was able to give the people there a sense of their own history. I think it would be morally very problematic to say we will not return this because we either got it from conquest or some Indian king or Maharaja sold it quite legally uh, because there were political pressures on them. So I think these are issues one has to think about very carefully. The, the, <clears throat> the ecology of the work must also be part of it. Will it go somewhere where there are no uh, 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 conditions to preserve it? Now, so as I say, you know, you would, many people would want, you, want to make a very easy answer, but because I work with museums, I know that the issue is, and I work with museums in both, and I know about museums intimately, both in my own country, India, as well as in the United States. So I know there are all these complications. Very often people will say, we just don't have the resources and the conditions in terms of the, uh, uh, the curatorial conditions. We cannot take on this. If we took on this object, it would eat up three quarters of our budget for everything else. So I think these questions have to be um, uh, discussed. But the default view, in my view, is if there is an object or a set of objects that is Im deeply important, for establishing the historical consciousness of a people, that that object was addressed to those people at that time. All these are questions that have to be taken. Then it's very difficult to say, no, we will not give it because there was some contract or there was some battle at which we were given this as part of the um, spoils or we somebody bought it and took it. I think the provenance question has to be very, very carefully examined and with a default that if the provenance and if the conservation, the restoration can be maintained so that the object does not deteriorate, then I think we have to have a very real discussion about this. But that discussion cannot be a quarrel between, on the one hand, people who say we need it because it's ours, or imperialists or the institution to say, no, we are keeping it because it was given to us. That polarization destroys the discussion completely. Then it just becomes another political battle. And over these cultural issues, we have to be much more sophisticated than the notion of, you know, nationalist possessiveness or imperialist possessiveness. I think we have to really think in a third way ar ar around these issues. So there is another issue that is polarizing and polarizing a specific moment because one of the major um, forms of resistance that emerged, for example, with the Black Lives Matter demonstrations was the removal and in some cases disruption, disruption, destruction of sculptures uh, in the public, in public space. Um, monumentalizing or uh, memorizing figures and events relating to colonial uh, histories and legacy. So how do you see these active interventions uh, within the public sphere and debates surrounding them? We have again this kind of view that sees this act of active vandalism and there is this view that uh, describes them as 
long due acts of political and cultural justice by communities that suffered degradation and oppression. And I was thinking about Walter Benjamin's famous saying that there is no document of civilization that is not at the same time a document of barbarism. Should monuments of barbarism be dismantled or preserved as warning? And maybe the problem is with the, with the, with the notion of the, with the very idea of a monument. Maybe we should reconsider the idea of the monument. As for example, a recent exhibition in the uh, new museum uh, on sculpture that was titled Unmonumental. <clears throat> My dear Barrett, uh, if we had to reconsider the whole question of what is a monument, then we would not be having this discussion. I think for this discussion, given that we have, you know, another 20 minutes in hand or whatever, we have to begin with the problem that we have. And the problem is that these monuments exist and they exist in their monumentality. Right. We can't do anything about that. We can have another dis argument about whether we ever want such monuments again and what is the problem with monumentality. You know about this better than I know, but I think that what we've got to now do is to say, yes, there have been these monuments. And yes, at the moment, there is an issue, as you quite rightly put it, about removing these monuments seen either as acts of vandalism or seen as acts of cultural justice and cultural rights. Uh, so let me then take this on by um, going back to your um, um, reference to Walter Benjamin. Yes, Walter Benjamin says there is no object of, uh, there, there is no object of civilization, which is, all, which is not at the same time an object of barbarism. Now, very few of these sculptures or these monuments take this seriously because what Walter Benjamin is saying, what fits into his larger theory of translation, his larger theory of aesthetics and ethics is that at the same time as we see an object of civilization, we should be aware of its barbarism. The whole point about most of these monuments is they are nobody says these are barbaric. They always say these are part of our history. And the fact that so and so was a slave owner where happened, but he was a slave owner. But look what he provided us with. He provided us with the money for the university, he provided us with this park. So the argument usually is let's not think about the barbarism. Let's just think about the, civiliz civiliz the civilizational facade. And I think that's why the, um, uh, the, the Benjaminian quote is both very interesting, but not applicable. If there was a certain way of presenting many of these monuments and showing graphically to the citizens or the, or the residents, because now we must not also fetishize citizens in our society. There are many who are undocumented, refugees, asylees. So I'm always very careful in using the word citizen, but let's say generally the, the residents or the inhabitants of a place, if you actually demonstrated actively that these figures were also participating in a social, cultural and political barbarism, then it would be different. But that's not the way in which monuments work. Monuments are hagiographic. They are large, they're put on plinths, they're often beautifully made, particularly equestrian monuments, which I admire because I love horses. Uh, and, and when you look at them, you're not expected to say, oh God, you know, this man might have done this good, but in fact, he was terrible in the other aspects. They don't have this bifocal vision. All monuments try and give you a unilinear, unifocal vision. And I think that's what protesters are saying. And I do believe that monuments in public places, which carry with them a history of oppression, violence, murder, uh, entrapment, slavery, and colonization, 
are out of place in public spaces, in public spaces where the population has changed so incredibly. And you know, we can give people the rights of dignity in the law books, in the regulations, but the real right of respect and dignity is if you can walk the city as a free person whose history, which may have been a history of slavery, is not being confirmed and affirmed by a figure, a slaveholder or a slave merchant whose monument is up in that same public space. I think you have to think that way. Monuments are not there for all time. Monuments were erected at a particular time within a particular ideology. I don't want to waste my time by saying the people who did it 200 years ago were were, you know, heartless, were, I don't want to, there's a waste of time. How do we think of it going forward? We think of it going forward by thinking the public spaces change, the demogra demographics have changed, public values have changed. There may be some people who still believe in white supremacy or slavery, but as a country, this country will never say, yeah, we believe in white supremacy in the United States. Even in the face of evidence, they will never say we are a racist society. People resist that, even on the conservative side, they, on the very traditional side. So I think public monuments must confront the era in which we live, the sentiments and, uh, and the, the sentiments of the people who circulate in those spaces and the aspirations, the best aspirations of people who live in those cities and towns. Now, do we solve the problem of history by removing a monument? We absolutely do not solve it. Nor do I believe that by removing a monument, people forget the past. People don't forget the past. People don't uh, think about slavery or colonization because there is a monument or the monument is taken down. And if our education system is such that somehow by removing the name of a, of a building or taking off a monument, the past is made uh, uh, f forgettable. Then the history, then the society is a very infantile society. That is not, we, and we know, and the education system is very bad if a whole history is forgotten because some usually mediocre piece of sculpture is removed. But I would suggest that, as I see, that in fact, these monuments, which have a certain historical emphasis, should be put in an area like a museum or a museum garden or a sculpture garden. Uh, so people who want to look at that work, there could be people who are profoundly against slavery, but who believe, who are very interested in monumentality, or they're very interested in a particular art form, that they go and see this. Uh, there could even be some people who believe that they want to celebrate somebody, well, they could do it privately, you know, in, 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 a, in a more restricted space. And people who go to these places, this is the most important point about democracy, choose to go to these places. They say, I'm going to look at this um, equestrian sculpture of a, of, a, of, a, of a dictator. I don't believe, I mean, I am opposed to the politics, but I'm very interested in equestrian sculpture. I want to see what it looks like. I want to that's perfectly right. But this idea that if you remove a sculpture, you're removing history, then you have no history at all. Then what kind of history is this, is this society or, or community based on? That removal of a sculpture creates a kind of historical mind blow, a mind attack, and bullshit. So I think that one should have a place where these uh, uh, monuments exist in a kind of more museal form and, you know, we have this in, in, in Bombay. They have taken many of the colonial sculptures uh, and put them in this rather beautiful, uh, there's a, the, a, a, a large garden where there is a museum uh, and next to the museum is a, is, a, is, a, is a zoo. And between the museum and the zoo, they have placed many of these sculptures. They're looked after as well as any public artwork is ever looked after in India, which is not very well, but they are there. So somewhere between the museum and the zoo is an ideal location. And I'm talking very practically. This was what happens in my city in Bombay. Okay, but all that's, this, yeah. 
all this hasty thing, you remove a sculpture, you are taking away the history. Why does the history happen in that public space? History is a much wider thing. It's a much wider narrative, and it's part of the education system. It's part of the media. It's part of the books people write. Don't give me that. A very good, a very good answer. Very interesting idea. Where to put those sculptures near the zoo? In between, oh, yeah. in the museum. Don't get me wrong. Yeah, in between the museum the... and the zoo. Yeah, that that that's a hybrid space. Hybrid. That's, that's the Bombay solution. I'm not saying it's a solution everywhere. I am saying that's what they did in Bombay. Okay. The unfortunate thing in Bombay is that many of the new public uh, um, statues. To some people who I I object to do, but uh, in the main, even amongst the best of them, they're so badly made. That's the real problem. That in the sculptures they put on their plinths are really not public sculptures, in my view, of any real value. Okay, last question: personal and conceptual. Um, in your life, you moved from India to the UK, the US. How do you think this transitions affected the way you perceive the role of intellectual in the globalized world? And I'm thinking about Foucault, who famously argued that the role of the intellectual is no longer to be a barrier of universal values, but a person occupying a specific position, deriving from his or her life, class, war conditions, and from the politics of truth in society. So for Foucault, the essential political problem for the intellectual is not to criticize ideological contents, but, and I'm quoting, asserting the possibility of a new politics of truth. So my question is, is it possible to envision a new politics of truth under the regime of post true and alternative facts, how can we rethink the role of the specific intellectual in a globalized world? Um, <clears throat> look, let's get the big words out of the way first. <laughs> so this uh, the idea of the universality of truth has always been problematic to me. It's problematic to me because universalism, uh, universalism assumes a kind of homogeneity of cultural value, uh, a homogeneity of a perspective of historical value, a homogeneity on the perspective of who is or what is, who is the human being and what is humanity. And the more you think about it, these universal values have very often been used for instrumental ends. We decide to imprison dissident, this, this, this dissident, because, why? Because we don't believe that this view represents the full blossoming of the universal culture in which we live. We think this is a corrupting view, so we pack work. These people, our, um, uh, th this minority group is somehow uh, not part of our nation. It's not part of the universal history of our nation. We put them in ghettos or we put them in slums. So I think universality, even, up, even if you think of the great conventions like the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the universal argument is open to being distorted, used for instrumental purposes, used for pragmatic purposes. So I think that there are experiences that we consider to be universal. Love, life, death, sex, value, parenting, uh, aesthetics, art. These are, of course, universal experiences. But not every love is like every other love. There is a whole context for loving. Not every death is like every other death. If you die uh, in, 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 uh, on the road with a bullet 
uh, pumped into you because of a law and order situation or you die in your bed these are all you die of a disease of coronavirus all these great universal terms have only got meaning in there when they're put in in particular cases and in relation to particular causes they don't signify their universality in some abstract realm that kind of abstract theoreticism i don't agree with so let me just let's get rid of that that issue around universalism i think universalism there are enough people you know people who say we are universalists we believe in human value and human rights and yet i will lock up x y and z who disagrees with me right. the justification of violence is as much on the grounds of universalism as it is on parochialism or pragmatism so i think universalism we've got to be very careful it's not the things do not have a certain universal effect or a universal affect universal emotionality but we've got to be we've got to be actually a uh, very careful with that and that brings me to foucault because you remember foucault says something very profound which has stayed with me he says there is no truth right there are only battles or struggles around the true so in saying that he is both unseating some universal notion of truth because he knows that the people who talk about the virtue of freedom are the first people to imprison as i said earlier on britain was the leading liberal ideological power in the 18th and 19th century it didn't take them much time to come to india and to 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 refuse the rights of citizenship to the the, the indian population over whom they ruled so you know the 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 idea of universalism is always or the truth is always a struggle an ethical struggle for trying to establish what you think is fair and just and equal so when foucault says there is no uh, truth there is only a struggle or a war uh, around the true he's saying two things one is what i've already said that these universal values have to be seen in a framework to understand what value they really have but the second thing he says i think is very important because he's saying a culture or a civilization must be able to be a platform to be a society where people can dispute amongst each other discuss not only agree amongst each other they can dispute they can discuss they can disagree and that brings us to the ethics of interpretation at the very heart of humanistic teaching and humanistic learning humanistic pedagogy in the university in the school but also humanistic principles in all the institutions that we participate in which is there has to be a space for the right to interpret that my interpretation my version of how i would confront a problem or how i would frame value when we talk about truth it's about framing values my way of a framing value i have to be open to and genuinely open to a discussion around it and those who critique me have to be open to listening as to how i am construing or constructing value or values and i think that that can only happen in a genuinely transparent and democratic society uh where dialogue is important whether it's the dialogue or discussion amongst political parties or political groups whether it is the dialogue and the freedom of interpretation in the press whether it is the way in which in educational institutions we work with ourselves self examination is always important we work with ourselves as faculty but with our students too to be able to give them the arts of interpretation to be able to say you have to look beyond the frame that you have beyond the framework with which you are working not because simply you have to listen to somebody else but it's by actually stepping outside your frame that you can see the value 
of your own framing of cultural or moral or political values. Okay. You are stepping outside. You are looking at yourself with the eye of the stranger, the eye of the foreigner, <clears throat> because you need to do it to understand where you stand and whether the ground on which you stand is the right ground or the firm ground for yourself before even you say, I'm listening to the opinion of others because I want to embrace other views. You know, Hannah Arendt has a beautiful reference to Socrates uh, in a great late essay of hers where she says, when you go home at night, you will find sitting in your home a very inconvenient friend who will question you about what you did that day. You will be irritated. You will get angry. But if you don't listen, to this inconvenient friend, you will be lost. That's a beautiful quote. That so, inconvenient friend is yourself always. Difficult, very difficult thing to, to do, but I think it's very important. So we have uh, two questions from the audience that relate to the question of the monument. <clears throat> Adi Gura is asking, do you think that public spaces are still relevant in the digital era? And another related question, following the issue of monuments, what is your position about street renaming after the transition from colonial or dictatorial order to a democratic one? <laughs> okay. So my answer uh, to the first question is, Public spaces are exceedingly important, despite the digital commons. That is not to say that digital space, as I've been arguing around the unprepared, is, is, not, is, is in any way trivial. It's extraordinarily important for the discovery of agency and also the destruction of agency, depending on which side of an argument you stand. So I think digital space is very, very important. But we walk, when we walk, we walk on the ground. We don't walk on the screen of our uh, computers, although we can have, um, you know, images which, allow, which make us think we're taking long journeys on our computers. We can have image worlds. But when we walk, when we take public transport, when we go to work, when we go to school, we walk in public spaces. And I think that's not going to change anytime soon unless we are locked in quarantine forever. Uh, if we are locked in quarantine forever, I will answer my friend's question again in a, different, in a different moment. If Professor Neumann will give me the opportunity to appear back in Tel Aviv. But let me just say, I think public space is where people walk, where people see each other, where people encounter each other, where they take a dog for a walk, they take an ice cream, they take their children. And I think Public spaces are crucial. And indeed, think about it. Would the demonstrations against police brutality in the United States have been the same if people got onto a chat box uh, and registered their support and solidarity? I think assembly or assemblage itself is a political act. And it's not just the people come together as an assembly. There's a lot of talk about assembly. It's what they bring together rather like a montage, what you assemble like a collage or a montage of differences. That's important in public space. I think that that is um, uh, absolutely crucial, uh, which is not to take away from the importance of digital space which has its uses and its abuses. And now, the naming of streets, <clears throat> you the know, yeah. the renaming of streets this is very interesting. I think that uh, 
<laughs> yes, I think that there are certain names of streets or buildings that you should, if the community around them, working in them, working around them, having deliberated, feels that these names are inappropriate, they're wrong, they bring the wrong echo to the institution at the moment, my argument for statues would be that. There has to be a, a process of deliberation and people feel this sends the wrong message. I don't want to walk into a building which has the name of a slave owner, for instance, or a xenophobic racist, even if that person's money built this building. You know, I think once it's in the public sphere, it is a public building, even if it belongs to a private university. So I think that the changing of name, names is uh, is certainly justifiable in certain in, in certain conditions. However, the problem is that very often when the colonial name is taken down, for which there is a good reason, other nationalist names of nationalist leaders who can be equally uh, 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 questionable, their names get put up, and they all. And I think that in itself is problematic. So maybe what we don't need, what we don't shouldn't have is names. We should only have numbers. But if we only had numbers, my uh, everyday encounter with social fabrics would be awful. <laughs> when I'm in Bombay, I like saying I'm going to Grant Road. Now, I don't know very much about who Mr. Grant was. I think he may have been the first, one of the early engineers. I don't know what he was like. Maybe he uh, did things that I would disapprove of. But I prefer to say I'm going to Grant Road. Or I'm going to Princess Street or I'm going to Hornby Road, or I'm going to Mahatma Gandhi Road. I, I like saying those words. I don't want to say I'm going to see you on the corner of 111th and 27th, which is why I'm always lost in New York. I never know where I'm going. So this is a very personal creed de coeur, you know, I'm sorry. Ram, do you want to ask a question? No, actually, uh, thanks. First, I would like to thank you both for a thought-provoking uh, conversation and for your statement at the beginning. Um, it was really extremely interesting and you know I take your word and you definitely have to be back here for another yes, yes. conversation or we have to figure very it out. Generous. Thank you, you're all very generous to me. As Thank I you. said, you're always welcome here. But you know when you talked about, I thought it was very interesting that you evoked uh, Kierkegaard and it made me think of his distinction between um, the freedom of speech and freedom of thought saying that you know freedom of thought is much more important and, and sometimes you know we use freedom of speech speech as a as a means to compensate on the lack of freedom of thought and when you think about expression and also in terms of monuments and buildings i thought it was very interesting to think about about that in, in relation to contemporary um uh, conditions that in a way many regimes try to on the one hand um narrow or limit our, our way of thinking, but then, uh, um, you know, within the social media, media, we are supposedly have the freedom of, of speech. So I think Kierkegaard is, you know, is becoming very relevant for contemporary conditions, as, as you said. So I thought it was, you know, it was a brilliant, so it was just one, you know, you know, um, just my, my input for, for this discussion. Well, thank you very much. Uh... Iran, I very much agree with you, and I agree with you on the importance of uh, Kierkegaard for a whole number of reasons. Uh, you know, during the lockdown, there were people who talked about Kierkegaard's notion of time, you know, which, would, which was kind of important. I've tried to talk about in terms of time and the future, and the notion of suddenness, which I think is very important. And then now you bring this interesting tension in Kierkegaard between freedom of thought and freedom of speech. And you're absolutely right. Um, uh, I think in some ways they're related because I uh, because governments that impose freedom of speech bans are trying to impose freedom of thought uh, restrictions. Now, the problem is when that happens, how do we express ourselves without being thrown into jail? And as we learned from many of the Soviet countries, uh, and indeed many minority communities, where they are restricted, both in terms of speech and thought, they try and find other expressive media, which is where you begin to get allegories. 
uh, people writing in parables, in allegories, in using animals to describe uh, political situations. So I think the real issue there is that, of course, faced with the barrel of a gun, who knows what any of us would say or not say, who knows what any of us would think or not, there'd be few people willing to take the shot. But to control a whole population, speech or thought, often results in artists, writers, thinkers, musicians, dancers finding other modes of expression. And by finding those modes of expression, they also help us to free our own thinking. All right. We have one more question. I, are you tired? Should we? No, no, no? no. Okay. Let's take this uh, last we, question. We have this last question. With museums um, like the British Museums refusing to return the Elgin marbles, certain objects to their native countries with their argument that the native countries will be unable to care for the objects. Do you then think that the museums have a duty in some way to facilitate the possibility for the ability for what they would consider adequate care? Sure. I mean, there's no question that I, I work with many museums. And, uh, and, and, and I cannot think of any of my colleagues in museums who would not be willing to do that, to uh, explore the possibilities of what you call adequate care. Um, uh, and I think that that's a very important question. There is also, um, there, just as there is no right uh, with, because of a certain colonial or imperial provenance, for a museum to say, this is ours. I think that this is a, a, a very problematic thing. And remember, even those who don't want to return these objects never say that this is ours. They say, we are the stewards of this. We want to look after it for, because people from all over the world can come to London or people from all over the world can go to Berlin and they can all see these works of art and they can make their historical and aesthetic comparisons. Now, part of that is true, but that, if you think about it like that, the metropolitan centers then have a right to hold on to everything. So I think we've got to question that. So I think, of course, there should be a, uh, 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 there should be a, a possible, uh, the, the possibility, the potential of returning something that of people's feels that it is crucial for their historical sense of historical tradition or rejuvenation or whatever. But we must also, when you know, the, the questioner said returning it to their native place. Now, I would, just as I don't see any pre-given, predestined excuse for a major music, museum in the West to hold on to any object, the case is to be made. There is no case in itself. I would also like to know whether this object, which after 1,500 years or after 500 years or is being returned to a government, is that government going to use this for nationalist xenophobic uses? I'm not saying that I'm not giving you the decision, yes or no, but I want to ask that question, just as I question the right of the British Museum to hold on to anything it may think it can hold on to without considering the due care and due uh, and longevity of the work, which I think is very important. I would also think that would I want to return something that may be used as an anti-minority anti emblem? Is that not my concern? Should I say, no, I need to return it, although this was taken from a country when there was no, uh, 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 no nationalist populist government, I should return it to a national populist government. I'm not saying that I would say no, but I would say that has to be part of the calculation. There are many countries in the world today where I think the uses of traditional uh, or heritage works would be used to knock a lot of people on the head with. And I would want to know that. So the word native set off this alarm bell. Many governments that think they have the native right 
are often governments that at least I very humbly and modestly do not see as really taking an object and opening it to the various peoples in the world. We know in India today, there are seriously people, and I've seen it on television, it's not a majority, but there are seriously people who argue that the Taj Mahal was originally a Hindu building. There are many people who want to erase the Islamic history of Indians, of India's northern heritage monuments. They want to rub it out. And this is part of them wanting to exclude Muslims from participating as Indian citizens in the history of the country. These are very complicated matters. I'm sorry, I cannot, there is no simple right and wrong here. But the openness to repatriation, of course, there should be an openness and an open discussion, just as there should be uh, an open discussion as to how these objects may be used politically, socially, culturally. And therefore, I hate saying this, but there should be some, I'm not saying neutral body, but I'm saying there should be some ecumenical body, somebody in which both parties have faith. There should be part of a proper arbitration policy. It cannot be decided um, uh, without the consideration of all these issues. So we have one last question. Oh. Is it possible or, because it's a very yeah. good question that you would love. I decided that you would like it. It's by Thank one you. of our uh, distinguished faculty, Adi Luria Khayoun, and she wants to go back to your provocative uh, concept of the unpreparedness. And she says this, the ethical thought and action towards deliberation, freeing oneself from clear and coherent accordance of self-reflection produces state, states of indeterminacy that are necessary for your ethical proposition. My question is how will a shared ethics look like in this state of things? Uncertainty and indeterminacy as ground. How would this come into practice daily life? How do we balance this proposition for freedom with maintaining community, individuals, that in the name of uncertainty will not kill. Sorry, I didn't get the last bit of it. What is it? That how do we balance this proposition, proposition for freedom with maintaining communities, individuals that in the name of uncertainty will not kill? Oh, dear distinguished faculty, thank you very much for staying with Ati us. Luria Khayun, she's our faculty yeah, artist for department. Uh, well, I, I'm sorry, I can't quite get your name and I don't want to mispronounce it, but dear distinguished faculty, thank you for a real brain teaser. <laughs> uh, um, uh, let me say this. My argument is that these moments of unpreparedness are of their very nature parts of the culture of community. Like any community affect or effect, not all parts of that community have the same response, but, and there, and there could be very different approaches to it, but there is something held in common. And what is held in common is the impact of a particular moment. I said, take 9-11. For instance, take 9-11, that within, and I'm not, and I don't want to say this is a whole global affect, but it is a situational ethical issue. Of course, there could be some people who are not part of it, but I think that all the instances I've given, whether it's COVID, whether it's Black Lives Matter and the protest, isn't it interesting that the moment of the unprepared, the moment of suddenness brings together a kind of solidarity? That's what made me think about this, a solidarity based on cultures of difference, at least in the United States. Isn't it interesting that the similar kind of draconian 
um, sudden legislations based on by uh, authoritarian governments draws together Muslim women, uh, Dalits, a whole group of people who came together, who if they sat down and started thinking, what would be the situated ethical basis on which we could get together might not happen. Therefore, I am not saying that this is the only moment. I mean, it's quite clear from the beginning that there are long histories of deliberation and thought, but let us not take this moment of unpreparedness and suggest that it is so contingent that it cannot produce convergence, that it cannot produce community, that it cannot produce assemblage, and that it cannot produce or it or they, and it cannot produce as an effective as well as humane and ethical solidarity. The link between the affective and the ethical, I think, is not often pursued. So that would be <clears throat> one response. Now, can you guarantee in any way that there would not be in such a moment an act of uh, uh, violence or an act of murder or an act of um, uh, a, a, even a deliberate act of uh, destruction, such as those, you know, the protesters came out risking their lives. And I saw, it's only my experience, that the people who came to loot the shops came in large Cadillacs, jumped out and, and took the goods from all the shops here. They didn't come because they really needed them. They didn't come to take one sweater or two sweaters for the family. They came to take a whole... Uh, uh, a, a whole section of the shop so that they could sell it. Now, does, does that do any good to the cause? No. So you can have looting on the one hand without any political view at this moment of unpreparedness where you can have solidarity too. So the question is that this kind of polar, or this kind of oppositional response to an event happens anyway. It happens at every election where people vote against their better interests and only realize it later. All I'm saying is, let's think of this moment of the unprepared, not only as an existential response, which is also a political and ethical response, not only as a response by governments who precipitate these moments very often, telling the Indian um, workers, migrant workers, clear out of the cities, and go to the village where, of course, things get much worse on road. So I think that there is something about this particular temporality uh, and its effects that interests me. And in this moment, I think it is particularly important in my view. Let me <clears throat> also say that we know politics and ethics is, in the long term, a moment by moment, case by case, institution by institution, stitching together of a narrative. I'm saying we usually think in large institutional terms, institutional racism, 50 years of the law, 50 years of policy, and then somebody dies in the name of law and order. Some Dalit in India or some group of Dalits are um, show the highest COVID uh, readings, as indeed in the United States, African Americans, the highest COVID readings, Native Americans, now Latinos and Latinas and let the whole Latinx community. Let us be aware that these moments are absolutely crucial in shaping our sense of ethical judgment and solidarity. But can there be a guarantee that there will not be killing? Could there be a guarantee that there was no looting by people who didn't need to loot, who jumped out of luxury cars and emptied shelves, old shelves of shops and ran on to the next one on Fifth Avenue in New York? No, I can't, we can't, uh, there are no guarantees. The whole, the, 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 the whole uh, uh, project of the ethical or the political is to be aware counterfactually of what else could happen in order to think of what we want to make happen. Can you please ask my distinguished faculty friend whether this responds to the question or is there something that I have not said which needs to be said? Please ask. Okay, I will ask. Um, 
You think thank that you. It comes she to wrote the question? thank you. She wrote okay. thank you. So I guess you did answer the question. I hope so. And I think it's also it's a, you know it's a good note, a good message, a good, a clear and very, uh, very important message uh, to conclude. I mean, we could go for hours on and on. And again, I would like to thank you very much for joining us this evening here in Israel. I mean, it was thought provoking, and I'm sure people will be back to these ideas and and you know and talk and and speculate and maybe also argue with you. And then we'll be glad to continue these conversations. <laughs> And I want to thank very much my friend Vered for leading this uh, discussion. Uh, so I wish you a good afternoon and I wish good night to everyone here in Israel and elsewhere in the world. Uh, so thank you for joining us. And, uh, thank, you. thank you. I hope I was clear in my responses. You, you were very were clear. Very clear. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, audience. Thanks, everybody. Good night. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.